Hey everybody, we are back with Unit 5's FRQ. Um, hopefully slightly less animal filled with noises this time. Um, this is an FRQ that focuses on gas laws and I think it actually does a decent job of doing a lot of gas laws in this problem, but there are some intermolecular force questions and a good old Lewis structure on there. So um, that should be good fun for everybody. Um, if we take a look, they give you to start off with the equation CS2 plus 3Cl2 turns into CCl4 and S2Cl2. So if we start looking at the actual information, it says carbon tetrachloride can be synthesized according to the reaction represented above. A chemist runs a reaction at a constant temperature of 120 degrees in a 25 liter container. Mm, this feels like an ideal gas law problem coming up. If we look at A, it says chlorine gas is initially present in the container at 0.4 ATMs. How many moles of Cl2 are in the container? And I am correct. We have P, nope, lies. We have T, we have V, and we have P here in our problem. So now we can do our um, ideal gas law and solve for N, and we should be good to go. So we've got P, V, equals N R T. We are looking for a number of moles, so we're going to have to divide by R T on both sides. I know that some of you guys like to put the numbers in first. I don't, but that's totally fine. So we're going to end up with N equaling P V over R T. Remember with your gas laws, you have to convert your temperatures to Kelvin. They cannot be left in Celsius. To convert from Celsius to Kelvin, you have to add 273. So in the case of this 120 degrees Celsius, that's actually 393 Kelvin that you're going to be dealing with. To use the ideal gas law, pressures need to be in atmospheres if you want to use um, the R value that has atmospheres in it, and you need to have your volume in liters. But we have our volume in liters, we're good to go. Temperatures converted to Kelvin, pressure's already in ATM, and so here we go. N equals P, which is 0.4 ATM, so we've got 0.4 atmospheres, times the volume, 25 liters, divided by R. Now, I believe that the R that they give you is slightly different than the 0.0821. You can use their R value or you can use 0.0821. I'm going to use that. And remember, you have to have the units on here to get the point. If you leave the units off, you do not get the point, even though this should be an easy calculation for you. So you have to have the atmospheres, liters, over mole kelvins, and then you are going to multiply that by the temperature, which is 393 kelvin. And when you put all of that into your calculator, you end up getting 0.31 moles of Cl2. So again, don't forget temp in kelvin, volume in liters, pressure in atmospheres, so you can use this K value, oh, this R value, I'm sorry. There is an R value given to you on the equation sheet that's in TOR, which you could use, um, but then your pressure has to be in TOR, so it's kind of up to you which of your personal preference is. For part A2, it says how many grams of carbon disulfide are needed to react completely with the Cl2? So we got a stoichiometry problem on our hands. We know that we have 0.31 moles of Cl2, <clears throat> and we want to go to carbon disulfide, which is CS2. So if we look here, we've got Cl2 and CS2. There is a coefficient of 3 in front of the Cl2. So it's going to be 3 moles of Cl2 for every 1 mole of CS2. Now, I know a lot of you guys want to always go back to grams in your stoichiometry. Don't do that. Your starting information is already given to you in moles, so resist the urge to do more work. It's asking you to go to grams of the CS2. So to finish off, we're going to need the molar mass of CS2. Add up two sulfurs and a carbon, and you should get a molar mass of 73.13 grams of CS2 for every one mole of CS2. When you pop that into your calculator, you should get a mass of 7.9 grams of CS2. In this particular problem, it's actually a two-point question, 
one point is given for understanding that it's a one to three mole ratio, and then another point is given for there being 7.9 grams at the end, okay? Moving on to B, it says at 30 degrees Celsius, the reaction is thermodynamically favorable. So if you remember, that's a negative delta G, but no reaction is observed to occur. However, at 120, the reaction occurs at an observable rate. It says explain how the higher temperature affects the collisions between the reactant molecules so the reaction occurs at an observable rate at 120 degrees Celsius. You know that if the temperature is higher, the particles are moving faster, so they are able to collide with each other harder, which means that they have more energy overall to react. So that's what we need to discuss in this problem. So what I'm gonna say is basically what they say in the problem. At a higher temperature, the molecules have more kinetic energy so when they collide they have enough energy to overcome the activation energy <clears throat> and that should be enough for them um, to answer that question. All right, B2 says the graph shows a distribution for the collision energies of reactant molecules at 120. Draw the second curve on the graph that shows a distribution for the collision energies of reactant molecules at 30 degrees Celsius. So when we're talking about things that are at a higher temperature, we've talked about how the curve that they have stretches out because there are a larger number of possible molecular speeds and energies that are happening. And so if we think about the total number of molecules, like the total area of the curve being the same, what happens when something is a lower temperature is the energy needs to head closer to zero and then the total possible energy ranges narrow down quite a bit. So I'm going to have a higher peak here. And then what's really important also is that we have less molecules having the activation energy. So we've got a higher point here that's more towards the left and then a lower activation energy. <clears throat> In this graph, to get one point, you have to have it above and left. And to get the second point, you have to have the activation energy value lower. All right. Moving on to C. S2, Cl2 is a product of the reaction. In the box below, complete the Lewis electron dot diagram for SCl2 by drawing all of the electron pairs in. <clears throat> Lines are okay in this particular problem, so if you wanna do that, that's okay. Remember, with all your Lewis structures, I know you just want to add lines and dots and make everything single bonds. You need to go through and check your valence electrons. So I have in my sulfur six valence electrons and there are two sulfurs. Chlorine, each of them has seven and there are two of those as well. So I have 12 and 14 electrons, which means my picture needs to have a total of 26 electrons. No more, no less. Sulfur and chlorine could potentially have expanded octets, so you do not want to just assume everything is single bonds. Sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> so if we do our Lewis structure, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to connect with lines. If you want to draw those as dots, you can. Drawing those three lines takes away six electrons, which means I'm left with 20. If I look at my Lewis structure, I need two, four, six, eight, ten. 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. And so I've got 20 electrons that I need, 20 electrons that I have. So in this case, you are going to be able to do this with all single bonds and you don't have any extras, but don't get cocky with this because it doesn't always work out that way. <clears throat> okay. 
for two, it says what is the approximate value of the CSS bond angle? We're talking about this bond angle here in the S2Cl2 molecule that you drew in part C1. If the bond angles are not equal, include both angles. So see how they have that? That's in case you draw your Lewis structure wrong, you can still get possible credit. But both of ours are the same here. If you look, we have two bonds and two unshared pairs. That leads us to a bent structure. Bent, the more bent, or as Matt would say, benter, it's the more bent one. And so technically our bond angle is going to be less than 109.5. If you look at the key, they said that they accept anything between 104 and 110. They're pretty generous with that range. All right. For D, CCl4 can also be produced by reacting CHCl3 with Cl2 at 400 degrees Celsius as represented by the equation below. We get this lovely equation. And then it says, at the completion of the reaction, a chemist successfully separates CCl4 from the HCl by cooling the mixture to 70 degrees Celsius, at which temperature the CCl4 condenses and the HCl remains in its gaseous state. So it says, identify all the types of intermolecular forces in HCl. <clears throat> so we look at HCl, draw a quick Lewis structure if you need to. You should be good at this at this point for HCl. Um, HCl, because you can draw a Lewis structure, has London dispersion forces in it, and the H to Cl bond is going to be polar, so it has dipole to dipole. My guess is they're asking you to see if you can understand that hydrogen bonding can't occur in here because the H is not connected to an O, an F, or an N. So in this particular case, it says identify all the forces. It does not tell you to write them a novel, it just says identify them. So I would say London dispersion forces, dipole to dipole, and move on with my life. All right. Last one for this problem says, what can be inferred about the relative strengths of the intermolecular forces in CCl4 and HCl? Justify your answer in terms of the information above. What they're meaning by that is to refer back to this paragraph where it says when you cool it down, CCl4 turns into a liquid and HCl remains in the gaseous state. What that means is something that turns into a liquid earlier or stays in the liquid phase and takes a harder amount or a larger amount of energy, it's harder to liquefy or to, I'm sorry, keep in the gas state. That is something that's going to have strong intermolecular forces. So based on the data that's in this problem, what it tells me is CCl4 has stronger intermolecular forces than HCl because it's condensing. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, so what I'll say is CCl4 must have stronger IMFs than HCl and I'll put this is indicated by CCl4 condensing at 70 while HCl remains a gas. <clears throat> so what happens is if something is able to stay a gas at that temperature, it means that the intermolecular forces are going to be weaker in that particular thing. Okay. Um, and I, do I feel like that's a, enough of an answer? Eh, maybe not. I might want to add a little more. So let me review. Must have stronger intermolecular forces in HCl. This is indicated by this condensing uh, HCl. And maybe I'll say um, substances that condense <clears throat> at higher temperatures have stronger forces. than those that stay gaseous.
I might be kind of repeating myself enough, but I feel like it's going to help out a little bit. Hopefully this clears things up a little bit if you're having trouble. If you don't still understand what's going on and you have some questions, come to me and we can clear things up. Good luck.